Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the February uh, 2020. Um, it's it's uh, yeah, the 2020. I noticed it when I was in my car this morning. Kind of a crazy number. But anyway, my uh, name is Kevin Mosher. I am an attorney at Thompson Co. And um, I am a uh, NSBA certified labor and employment specialist. And I'm excited to present this month's webinar on uh, immigration visas. Primarily, we're going to be focusing on the H-1B, um, though there uh, there will be a, a mention of some other other visas uh, that are a little bit more nuanced and specific um, as well. And then we're going to talk about the green card process and what you can expect. And there's some changes on the H-1B uh, process and um, what, what employers might expect in 2000, 2020. So we're going to talk about that. Um, and I'm uh, excited about talking about that, along with doing all the day-to-day -day HR, um, you know, counseling and help that I, that I provide to companies and nonprofits, um, I do a lot of immigration as well, helping, helping businesses and nonprofits get, uh, get employees, you know, um, foreign workers and green cards and that sort of thing. So I'm excited about talking about that because I don't get to talk about that as much on these, these webinars. I don't do these immigration webinars as, uh, as frequently, though I think we're doing an I-9 webinar later in the year because of the new, the brand new I-9 form that um, has just been finally approved and will be coming live. And if you don't know what I just said there and you're in charge of the I-9, you, um, you should go grab the new I-9 form because it's going to be uh, live pretty soon here. Um, okay, so this is me. And if you are not a member of our uh, HR um, my HR Genius program. You're welcome to try try out membership. It's a month to month program. It's pretty awesome, and you can. Um, this is the price for it, and literally you can call you know Thompson Co with HR questions as much as you want with no legal fees. So um, it's pretty or or emails too. So it's a pretty robust and and uh, exciting exciting program. And obviously we have enhancements and stuff like that as well. So oh, I just like lost my. Okay, here we go. So topics we are going to cover today. So we are going to talk, we're going to just step back a little bit. Oh, I, before I get into this, um, if you need HRCI or SHRM credits for this, uh, you should have filled out something letting us know that. But if you, for whatever reason you didn't and you still need them, let us know and, and we'll make sure to get the certification to you once we, once we confirm um, the uh, attendance. And then also, if you have questions, you are welcome. There's a little question box right there. And this webinar isn't going to be as filled with, uh, um, you know, as like uh, fast paced as maybe some of the other webinars that I more typically do in this uh, HR best practices webinar series. So um, feel free to write some questions. If you've got questions about other visas, I'm happy to to talk about them and, and address them as time time permits. But um, like next month, we're going to be talking about fundamentals of wage and hour law, and that's just going to—I mean, that's that's going to be a sprint. And then in April, we're going to be talking about complex uh, issues with with uh, wage and hour law. So you can imagine, it's just there's so much to cover with wage and hour. There's lots to cover here, but there's this is definitely much more time manageable than some of our other topics. So um, feel free to ask questions, and I'll try to get to them as I um, am going through here. So we're going to focus. We're going to start with uh, work authority and just kind of stepping back, 50,000 foot uh, overview of what is work authority, what it means to have work authority, and why that's an important thing. And then we'll talk about the H-1B process. We'll talk a little bit about what you need to know about what the new the new H-1B process for new H-1Bs, um, the new process for new H-1Bs. And then we'll talk about the green card process. So that you have a hopefully at the, at the end of the webinar, you will have a baseline understanding of one, what is the legal requirement in the United States regarding work authority? Two, how do I get my, especially my highly skilled workers hot, that are foreign um, nationals that, you know, not U.S. citizens, they're from different countries, how do I get them to work here in the United States? And uh, then three, if I really like them, what is my path to keeping them long term? And the answer to that is almost certainly a green card. Um, and then eventually they could become citizens, which is great for them. But really all we care about is getting them the green card because with the green card, they can work for you forever. Theoretically. Um, I know with HR people, we don't have that great of an expectation of people working forever anymore for companies. But 
um, you know, green card is a good way to lock to lock people down for several several years, especially highly skilled workers, which who are um, tend to be more mobile these days. Okay, so work authority. What is work authority? So every person working for your company, and I'm not talking about independent contractors because we don't have to, you know, know about their their work authority in the United States. But every person who does work for you. And what is work under federal law? It's to suffer or permit, um, you know, suffer or permit to work, right? That's employment, um, to suffer or permit to work. So anybody who's doing that, who is working for you, they have to have work authority. And we don't often think about this. We just know that, oh, yes, we, it's probably like somebody has to be legal to work in the United States. And so how do we do that? We do that with the I-9, right? The I-9 is this archaic and um, fairly worthless form, in my opinion, that we have all brand new employees complete. That is the, um, that's the great big test that we have to give to employees to confirm that, that they have work authority in the United States. And that's why we do Section 2. So if you're super familiar with the I-9 and you're looking at List A and then B and C and you have to ask, ask for the documents and so you have to see their passport or their driver's license and social security card combination, you know, whatever they provide to you, that is how we check um, and meet our federal obligation to confirm that employees can legally work in the United States. And if they cannot produce those documents on, on the second page, Section 2 of the I-9, if they can't produce sufficient documents, uh, then they haven't made that proof to us, and we really should not be hiring them. Um, because if we do, then there are penalties, right? And so if they provide us with a really good fake ID, um, that's you know that's fine. There's not going to be a, there should not be penalties for us because the penalties under federal law is that we need to have knowledge. So we need to know that the person does not have work authority in the United States. So did we knowingly, willingly hire them? Um, did we willingly hire them knowing that they did not have work authority? If the answer is yes, you could go to jail. Uh, HR people could go to jail. Business owners could go to jail. Anybody who has knowledge and hires the person could go to jail. So for the workers themselves, uh, if the person starts working for you, then there could be deportation. They could be deported. They could go to jail, too. They could be, once deported, they would then be barred from reentering the United States um, for, you know, a period of time, up to 10 years, depending on how long they worked illegally in the United States. So, and then there's fines and stuff for you. But again, it's, there's got to be knowledge. The point is, all people working for you, if you want to comply with federal law, need to have work authority in the United States. So the question is, what if you find a really good worker and they're in college? This is the typical process, right? So they're in college or maybe, hey, you know some people over uh, outside the United States and you want to bring them, bring them over. So you're going to need to get them work authority. And how do you get um, work authority. So that's where we start talking about visas. That's where we start talking about green cards. Um, so you can see from this sheet, like who is authorized to work? U.S. citizens, obviously, we all take it for granted that we can work in the United States. Uh, people who have the green card and then foreign nationals who obtain a visa. There's some other, like, there's some other statuses for like refugees and asylees and that sort of thing. But these are the people that can work in the United States. Um, before we get into the visas and talking about that, I do want to, so actually I'll sit back. Let's continue to, talking about the visas. So if the person is f a foreign national and they are outside the United States or they're inside the United States and they're a student, if they are going to work for you, and I don't care if it's a week and I don't, you know, I don't care if it's a day, if they're working for you, and unpaid internships don't count because those are normally not really truly internships. They're truly there. Very few companies that are not not nonprofits legitimately have unpaid interns. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, those those are employees. They almost certainly are employed uh, employees in most situations. Um, if you're a nonprofit, you have a better chance of having a person be an unpaid intern. But if you want to hire the person and if and employ them and you're going to be paying them wages 
and you know reporting payroll taxes, they're going to need to have a work authority. So if they're outside the country or if they're a current student, how are we going to get them work authority? And that's what this we're going to talk about here today. And one of the ca- case, the classification. So there's various different classifications, and these. They call them like H-1B visas or L visas or F visas. And the reason they're called these is just, you know, inside baseball is because if you want to look at the regulations, I don't recommend it um, unless you're an attorney. It's they're not enjoyable reads. Uh, They're fairly boring to to go through. So you just just take my word for it that if you were to look at the immigration regulations covering these visas, section subsection H sub subsection one says sub, subsection B would be the H1B visa. Uh, subsection L is what, so we call them the H1B visas. L is, you know, subsection L of the, of the regulations, that sort of thing. So I think you get the point. H1B visas, those are your highly skilled visas. L visas, those are for people that are coming from uh, within your company, but they're working in, abroad. So think IBM has a facility in Germany and they're sending the German, um, they're bringing the German manager over to the United States to spend a couple of years working at a U.S. Uh, facility. F visas are for students. So um, F is for students. I don't, you know, whatever, subsection F. B visas are people for traveling to the United States, but there's also the potential for visitor visas um, to work. So you can come to conferences. You could come from, take my IBM example, IBM for like a two-week period or a one-month period could send that same business manager over to the United States to work for like uh, a month, but then all the money would be paid to that, that business manager in Germany. So IBM would pay them just like, you know, through their normal payroll process. If you get an H-1B visa or an L visa for that person, you can actually pay them through the U.S. payroll, but no paying B people through the U.S. payroll. The O visas are for exceptional people um, in, that are performers or Nobel Prize winners, people that are like Mick Jagger, people that are like Nobel Prize winners. Um, you know, we're talking about we're talking about the top of the top within their profession. Those people are your O visas. And there's some other visa categories, but these are the ones. And so I mention this because you can see um, it, there's been some trending, so not a terrible surprise, but during the current Trump administration, there has been a serious drop in the number of people traveling for fun to the United States. I guess the United States isn't as fun anymore, um, either that or they're just excluding a lot of people from coming to the United States, which is probably more of the case. So you can see that between 2015 and 2019, last year, there's about 2 million fewer people coming to the United States on these B visas. That's interesting uh, to me. The number of people with H visas, however, has increased. So not everybody is being excluded from the United States. And this is the total aggregate number of people in the United States on H visas. Um, And we'll talk about how every year another 85,000 are added to this pile. So it is interesting that the number of H visas, which are for highly skilled employees, that that has increased significantly by about um, 150,000 during the Trump administration. Student visas, the F visas, take a look at that number of 2019, 388 or almost 389,000. And in 2015, it was almost 300,000 more. So um, I suspect our U.S. universities are having a hard time recruiting um, during this current administration. Um, You can see, and obviously we've all seen probably reports of anecdotal reports and and that sort of thing, but just seeing the aggregate numbers, it's um, astounding the the number of uh, fewer international uh, people coming to U.S. universities to uh, to study and uh, you know not everybody but a lot of those are the best and the brightest of those con- for those countries and they're they're going elsewhere I suspect or staying you know staying in their own countries okay so a little bit more background on these agencies I think this is important for people to understand we have multiple federal agencies that are overseeing the immigration process so 
uh, there's I don't even talk about ICE. ICE is ICE is there. We hear about that all the time. They do uh, raids and they are there to um, do enforcement of uh, people who stay overstay their status. So I'm not even talk about them because they're not really part of the visa uh, application petition and uh, process. So we've got the Department of Homeland Security. If you want a visa. Most visas you need to apply to the Department of Homeland Security um, and their U.S. CIS uh, sub-agency. Uh, you apply to them for the visa and for the and for the green card itself. They then issue you an approval. Uh, if if all goes well, they issue you an approval. When that person, so there then then that employee is probably fine to be in the United States on that visa on that quote as we call it status. If they leave the United States, they've got to come back in. Now, when you come back in, you don't just say, hey, I, you know, I got my Department of Homeland Security or USCIS approval notice here. It is. That's not normally how it works. Um, obviously, there are some exceptions. Every visa category is a little bit different. But for the most part, you then need to go to a U.S. embassy. So you take that approval from the Department of Homeland Security and you take that approval for the visa, and you go to a U.S. embassy, and then you actually make the application for the visa. And the visa then goes into your passport if, it all, if all works out well. So you get an interview at the U.S. embassy, and they do a background check. They're going to check to make sure that everything's verified and all that. And the Department of State runs the U.S. embassy. So they talk to the Department of Homeland Security. They do all the background checks, and then they will turn around and, and put the visa in your passport and then return it to you. And then with that passport, you can then come to a point of entry into the United States airport or, you know, uh, port, I guess, boat port, um, or crossing the border if you're coming from Mexico or Canada. And then you come to the point of entry and you show them the passport with the visa. The Department of Homeland Security will then check to make sure the visa, so they go back, they check their system, to make sure the Department of State actually issued this visa, and there's your big circle. And the person comes into the country, hopefully, you know, it's okay, and they get stamped, and, and uh, they come to the United States to be fine. It's important to understand this process, because when we apply here in the United States, we really we are applying for visas, we're applying for green cards, uh, for visas, but we are really not getting those, the employees are really not getting those visas until they... Uh, and until they leave the United States and then re-enter at a port of entry and get that visa in their passport. Okay, so going back to my example, you have found uh, an employee, a person, you want that person to be an employee. They're, let's just say they're a current student. They are on an F, uh, like Frank, visa at a U.S. university. Is it possible? And, they want, and you want them to work for you uh, because they're great. They, they seem great. Is it possible to get them to work for you? Yes, uh, it is possible. It ends up, um, so with a student visa, the employee can work for you for up to one year post-graduation for on that visa. So you don't even have to do anything. You just kick back and hire the person and they get the paperwork from the university and you fill out the I-9 uh, for them and they can work for up to 12 months post-graduation if they, if they, um, have a STEM uh, STEM degree, and if you then register for E-Verify, you can then get um, like a 29-month extension on it. So they can work for you for quite a long time before you actually have to do much other than enroll in E-Verify. They can work for you for quite a long time without getting an actual visa. If you then really like the person, then you have to uh, then you have to apply for a visa because eventually their F status is going to run out and they're not going to be able to work for you forever. And so you then need to transfer them. And the way to do it is to apply for a visa for them. And these are the visa categories. We've talked about them a little bit. You've got the H-1B. That's probably the way you're going to go. That's for highly skilled workers that are performing highly skilled jobs. Uh, I have a history degree. I say this all the time. It is not a highly skilled uh, degree. I would uh, stand no chance of getting an H-1B visa if I were hired with my history degree to go and work in a library or wherever history degree people work. 
Um, I am also uh, a lawyer, and so that is a specialized degree. And if for whatever reason a company, if I were coming out of law school and I were from you know France, and if uh, uh, a law firm at Tonsico wanted to hire me uh, to be a lawyer, they could they could apply for an H one B for me. Highly skilled job, highly skilled degree, specialized degree, right? Lawyer, uh, lawyer job requires a highly skilled degree of being a lawyer. There we go. I would be a great candidate as a lawyer for an H-1B, but a terrible candidate for a librarian as, with a history degree. Um, that's H-1B. You want an engineer. You want an IT person. You want somebody with a highly skilled, uh, like a marketing degree. You go H-1B. Intercompany transfers, that's not going to work for somebody coming from a U.S. university. That's only going to come, that's only going to be relevant for people if you're an international company and, or if you have a sister company abroad and you want to transfer those people into the United States. Canadians and Mexicans, we talked about the other two, O and B. Canadians and Mexicans, um, they can come in on TN visas. And that's specific to the NAFTA tree or whatever they want to call it now today. Um, no real changes occurred to the visa side of it. So Canadians and Mexicans can come in and work in the United States. They have to be in certain job categories, so it's very limited, the type of jobs that they can come in on. But that's something specific to Canadians and Mexicans. So um, is this all easy? Not really. Um, you probably need somebody like, you know, like me or some, you know, somebody else, some other lawyer that's, that does immigration to walk you through these these processes. Some of them are a little bit easier. Like it's pretty easy for Canadians to come in on t TN visas. Uh, it's pretty hard to get L visas. It's very hard to get O visas. It's very hard to get H-1B. It's hard to get H-1B visas. But TN visas are pretty easy. Canadians have to go to U.S. embassies and apply. Um, we make it a little harder on, on um, I'm sorry, Mexicans have to go to U.S. embassies to apply. We make it harder on them. Canadians can just show up at the border the port of entry, the airport, or, or cross, um, you know, physical border, and they can just, like, drive in and get their TN visa. But you technically can sponsor anybody. You just need to find out the category, uh, and so we need to always understand, like, what is their, you know, what's their um, – background, what's their education, what's the job that they're coming into, what are, what you know, are they coming from a sister company overseas, what is the whole situation. And based on all of that information, you know, uh, we can then figure out what is the appropriate visa, if any. And, the, you know, we're going to talk about H-1B process in a second because it's the most common and because there have been a lot of changes here. But just as a general rule, it is not, like, not everybody who's awesome uh, or a great potential worker can get uh, a visa to come to the United States. It's pretty tough. It's re you know I give a lot of bad news to to people, um, unfortunately, especially if the person's not highly skilled or if you've missed the H one B lottery. It's it's pretty tough to get a to get a visa. I mean you've got to really figure out a strategy for doing it, and there's not always a lot of, of avenues. Um, the United States does not make it you know contrary to all the news media and everything. And politicians, it's not easy to legitimately uh, come in and work in the United States. Um, it's you know, if you're highly skilled, it's easier. But if you're just a typical person and you wanna you wanna come in and work, you found a good person, you know some family member or whatever that lives in Brazil, and you wanna bring them up to work for your company in the United States, it's pretty tough. It's not there's not a lot of avenues uh, out there. So you really, um, you know, prepare to be disappointed. But there are avenues, and so let's, you know, for certain people, so we can talk about them. H-1B. So the H-1B is the most common for most businesses because it is with it is for highly skilled workers performing specific highly skilled, you know, job, specific jobs that require those skills. So, like I said before, lawyer, yes. Librarian, probably not. And I'm not saying 100% no librarians, but for the most part, librarians, no. You don't have to have a specific degree in librarian science uh, to work as a librarian. You could just be, you know, you could have any sort of degrees and probably work as a librarian. Same with um, a lot of business managers. You could be the vice president of whatever at the company. You might be a bigwig. But would you be eligible for an H-1B? Not necessarily. 
um, when it's tough to get general business degrees because, I mean, you don't have to have a specific degree to be like a vice president of operations, right? Um, to be the vice president of marketing, you might have to have a, a marketing degree, yeah. And so that might be a, you know, you might be able to get a an H-1B for, for um, a vice president of marketing or a manager of marketing because that job might require a marketing degree and might have to understand analytics and all that. But operations, uh, you probably don't even need a degree necessarily to be a vice president of operations. Um, so H-1B, you know, it's going to be very narrow. Um, we need... We are look for H-1B people. They've got to have highly high. They've got to have a high skill set. That skill set has to be typically acquired through a de- highly skilled degree program. STEM degrees are the easiest. They're the easiest to get the H-1, the H-1B. Um, and so you've got some commonly approved ones. Engineers, very common. IT specialists, you know, computer scientists, computer engineers, software engineers. Those are those are your bread and butter H-1B people. Lawyers were awesome, so we get H-1Bs. Um, so again, uh, teachers could get H-1Bs as well. Um, so there's you know highly specialized uh, workers requiring specialized specialized degrees, that's we get the H-1B visas for. So if you're going and you're recruiting for an engineer or an IT specialist or something like that, and you're recruiting at these schools, um, can you, and I will say this, can you ask, uh, is it illegal to ask if the person requires uh, work authority sponsorship? And the answer is no. You can ask for that. Um, people that are foreign nationals, they don't have the same type of um, protections that like U.S. citizens have. So it, you know, you wouldn't want to ask on in a, in a um, you know, um, an interview or on a job application. You won't want to ask if the person's U.S. citizen. Like that would not be a good, um, a recommended question to ask from a discrimination standpoint. But could you ask if the person requires sponsorship? And you can ask that. So if you don't want to sponsor anybody, that's fine. Like you don't have to sponsor somebody just because. They, um, you know, they've gone through the process and they're applying for the job, and then they say, "Oh, and by the way, I'm, I'm going to need an H-1B visa." You, you could just pull the plug on them right there at, at that point if you want. So, H-1B visas. Who's eligible? Highly skilled workers with jobs that require um, that require that they go to get a highly skilled uh, education. Again, no history degrees. Um, unless it's, you know, for a job that does require a history degree. Um, and if you know of a job that requires a history degree, let me know. I'd be really curious. So step by step. So what are we going to do? So we're going to, we're, we're going to identify the job. We need to figure this out. So, uh, is it an engineering job? Is it a STEM job? Is, you know, what is, what is the job here? We have to understand it. We, I always say this, whether it's for immigration purposes or ADA purposes or whatever it is, we have to understand is, the um, what is the job description and so we want to have a really good job descriptions key good job descriptions that are up to date and detailed are gold uh, to me I love to see them as an HR lawyer and so same for immigration we need to have a good accurate job description does the job require a specialized degree it had better if you want to get an H-1B um, again uh, look at the pool of people, uh, and that's not in here, but that's another thing that we need to look at. Do you have a group, let's just say um, you're hiring somebody to be a software engineer. Do you have multiple, do you have other software engineers? And if you have other other software engineers, do they all have specialized degrees, whether it's in you know computer science or software engineering or something equivalent? Do they have specialized degrees? And if the answer is no, then this probably you're going to have to figure out a different strategy, um, different job or something, because if you get audited and you show that, oh, hey, we've got like, yeah, one or two of our software engineers, they just, they learned on the job. They have associate's degrees. They don't even have a four-year degree. They learned on the job and they're, they're great. Well, that's not necessarily going to make them qualified to be an H1, you know, to get an H1B. It's got to be a job that requires, it's not just optional, it requires a highly skilled degree. And that jo- and the job description has to reflect that. Um, we have to understand comp- compensation as well because um, you're going to have to uh, get a prevailing wage determination from 
the government that's part of the H-1B, H-1B process. So um, anyway, so we've identified the candidate. We've figured out some compensation issues. We're going to, we've, we want to hire this person, so we're going to need to get an H-1B, okay? So then you, you call an attorney, you call me, you call somebody else, but you call an attorney, immigration attorney, and then um, we will, uh, you know, have to figure out if they, you know, make changes to the job description, make sure the job description reads right. We're going to have to make sure that this job really does require a specialized degree, and we're going to have to figure, figure that out. Then the next step we go to the Department of Labor and we ask for a labor condition application, an LCA. So we go to the Department of Labor. We say, hey, this is the job. This is where the person's going to work. They're going to be in Dallas. They're going to be downtown. They're going to be working as a software engineer. And, you know, we, we, pulled, the, we pulled the wage reports that are list, uh, listed by the um, uh, uh, Department of Labor produces wage reports, compensation reports, average for, for the Dallas metropolitan area. And we're going to see that, that an entry-level software engineer makes like $62,000 in Dallas. And then uh, somebody with a year of experience makes like 70 and, you know, goes up to like uh, level four. So we're going to figure out where we are. You know, can we make that wage? And we, and we apply for that with the Department of Labor to get the labor condition application. They're going to take about ten, um, a week to 10 days to turn it around, and they're going to hopefully certify, and they're going to tell us if they've certified us for that wage. So we get that certification. It shows that we're serious about doing the H-1B visa for this person, and, we, and um, we're going to use this as part because we need this certification before we even file the H-1B. So that's kind of like, you know, right in these steps, but it's a precursor to filing the H-1B. Okay. Then we go and we fill out the H-1B forms. And there's a bunch of forms to fill out for the H-1B. Here's, here are the fees that you need to understand. So everything up until this point outside, you know, legal fees, uh, everything is free, right? So no fees to the government, but then there's going to be some H-1B petition fees. So here are the current fees. We've got 460 uh, bucks. I think it's actually 1440 for the premium processing. So that's a typo. But it's it's uh, $460 for the application fee. Um, it's going to be, if you've got more than uh, 25 employees, it's going to be uh, 25 or more employees. It's going to be $1,500 for a training fee, $750 if you have fewer, and then $500 for a fraud fee. So right there, to the government for the H-1B, you got to take this into consideration when you're doing your recruiting and all that. You're looking at almost $2,500 in filing fees to the government, and then uh, lawyer fees on top of it. Uh, optional premium processing fees, to be, speed it up, it's going to be 1440, not 1460, 1440 today. That This number keeps going up, um, and that's going to go to the government as well. That guarantees a turnaround time of 15 days. Uh, for If you're doing the lottery, which we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, it doesn't. you don't need to do premium processing. I wouldn't waste the money, but... Um, you know, it's there if you're doing some other normal processing. Then you you receive the you obtain the H-1B approval, and that means that the person can start working for you as of the day of the uh, that's listed on the approval. So that's like step by step. So we identify, we figure out uh, the job, we figure out the salary, we file the labor condition application with the Department of Labor, we get that certified, then we file the H-1B, and then we get the approval, and the person can start working for us. You can do this for current people who are on current H-1Bs working for other companies. So if they're coming to you and they're saying, hey, I've applied for this job and I've got an H-1B visa with uh, company you know, XYZ over here and I want to start working for you, they can start working for you after you um, file the application, the petition for the H-1B. So they can start working for you pretty, pretty soon. Um, that's a situation where you might want to do premium processing because a lot of times these employees don't want to quit their job before they start working for you. So you might want to pay premium processing to get the 15-day turnaround so that they have assurance that there is a visa waiting for them because that visa then transfers over to you. That's step-by-step. Step. That is for people who currently have H-1Bs. If the person needs 
a new H-1B. They don't have a current H-1B. They've never been sponsored before for an H-1B. They're a current student on an F visa and they want to come work for you or they've been working for you, but they're on an F visa. They don't have an H-1B. They need to then, you need to then enter the lottery for an H-1B visa. Every year, the U.S. government on the federal fiscal year, which begins October 1st, on October 1st, they issue 85,000 uh, H-1B visas, and that covers for the whole year. Now, with the H-1B, you can apply six months in advance. So you're probably wondering, like, well, why do we always make these applications on April 1st? Well, the reason is because you can apply six months in advance. That's as soon as you can apply. So everybody and their brother applies on April 1st. And so the government's been allowing for, like, the first week. So in the first, like, five or so or seven days of the month, they've been saying, hey, all of you, because everybody is rushing to get in their applications in on April 1st. And, of course, more than 85,000 applications come in on April 1st. So the government then a few years ago said, fine, you can have that first week to make your applications for these 85,000. We'll take everybody in. We're going to throw everybody into a pool, and we're going to draw, like, little lottery balls or however they, they do it. They do it much more fancy than – much fancier than that um, uh, with digitally assigned numbers and stuff. But they will take everybody that comes in – and they will um, figure out the lottery process and who wins and who loses. And in the last several years, it's anywhere from 180 to 220,000 uh, visas come in in that first week of April for work authority that would start October 1st of, the, of that same year. So it's a complicated, convoluted, crazy system and your chances in the lottery are anywhere from one to two to one to three, depending on the year. And also it's a little bit better chance if you've got a master's degree from a U.S. university, because there's 20,000 of those are specifically only for people with, master, people with master's degrees from U.S. universities. universities. And if you don't get in that 20,000, because like you know, 30,000 people with master's degrees applied from foreign countries, but they, US, you know, they got master's degrees at a U.S. university, if like 30,000, then those 10,000 that didn't get selected, they roll into the greater lottery as well. So they get kind of like two cracks at it. So new process. The government um, never wants to uh, try to um, make a complicated process uh, easier. And they actually, I think we'll see, knock on wood, uh, we'll see how it gets implemented. It kind of seems like it, they might have helped along with this process. I'm, I'm optimistic that it's going to be easier this year than it has been in previous years, because in previous years, we just race all of our applications in to get them in on April 1st. Not the case anymore. If you are on uh, this webinar and if you want a new H-1B visa, you've got somebody at a U.S. university or somebody living in Germany or Mexico or wherever, and you want them, you want a chance at an H-1B visa, you need to enter the lottery. That lottery now begins March 1st. March 1st at noon Eastern. It starts and it closes on March 20th at noon Eastern. So you've got a 20-day window to get your little lottery ball uh, in there. And in the past, we had to prepare the entire H-1B petition and get the LCA and do the whole paperwork. And then, you know, I would do all my legal fees and everything to do this. And we would submit, and then we'd sit around and we'd twiddle our thumbs, sometimes for months, wondering if we got selected for the, for the H-1B lottery. That's not the case anymore. The good news is uh, you don't have to pay me to, like, prepare the whole thing anymore. So all we have to do is a um, much easier process. We just have to basically put our lot in, uh, $10 to file your chance at sponsoring this person. So going back to my example, I've got a person uh, who's on an F visa. Let's just say they're working here at my law firm at Thompson Co., and we say, hey, we want to F visa attorney. We want them to work long term for us, which, you know, because they're great. And so I now, I don't have to prepare a whole petition for them. I just need to go anywhere from March 1st to March 20th. Doesn't matter when, it's all going to be randomized anyway. It's all going to be part of the lottery. 
um, March 1st to March 20th, I'm going to fill out an online application. I'm going to get, I guess, you know, I'm doing it as the attorney. I'm going to get Thompson Co. to sign off on it. We're going to submit it with this attorney's name on it. And we're going to submit, pay $10, do all the online paperwork, and we're going to submit it. And boom, that person is going to be, we are going to be in the lottery. And we could do this for, I, we could do one submission for, you know, up to, I think it's like up to 200 or so people, technically. Uh, we can't redo it, so I can't submit like 200 applications for the same person and pay like, two, you know, $10 each, um, each time for the same person. They'll all get, they'll all get thrown away. Uh, but you can do, I can do one application, one lottery chance for one employee that I have, or prospective employee, if they're not working for me, uh, like an F visa or something else, and I can file it, and then I will be in the lottery. And then after the 20th, then they're gonna they're gonna do the lottery, and they're gonna you know do it however they do it with all their fancy computerizing and stuff, and then they're going to notify us through the online lottery system. They're going to notify us whether we've been selected. And then once we get selected, then we prepare, then we can prepare the H-1B petition and file it. And that's, although it doesn't sound, it, it is a lot easier. <laughs> As I like say it out loud, I'm not, I'm not sure it sounds a lot easier, but it is a lot easier than preparing the whole H-1B petition. And also it's potentially cheaper for you because, you know, you don't have to pay me to do the whole thing. You just have, you know, there's very little work. Um, just so, you know, maybe in half an hour to an hour's worth of work in putting in this, um, getting in the lottery itself. And so there's not a lot of harm if you think you've got somebody uh, internally or external. There's not, there's not a lot of risk in trying to get into the lottery. So I'll be really curious. In past years, we had over, you know, very typically over 200,000 uh, applications for the H-1B, I, I don't know if it's going to be higher or lower. We have so many fewer F students from abroad were, uh, studying in the United States. I, I, I mean, that's, that's likely to diminish the H-1B pool significantly, but I don't know. I, I really don't know what the lottery is going to, going to look like. I, I don't know how many people will have gotten the memo that they, that they should – you know, because every year I get it, I'll, I'll get a call or an email saying, "Hey, I want to do this H-1B," and it's like, you know, March 25th or something like that. And then we race to get into the lottery, and sometimes we get in the lottery, and sometimes we don't. But now, if if you don't make your, if you don't get, you know, if you don't throw your lot into this online system, uh, you're, um, you've got no chance. So there's, you know, you will not, you will be excluded from the lottery, and almost certainly we're going to have more than 85,000. Uh, applications. So, you know, if you don't get in between March 1st and March 20th, I think you're you're out of luck for uh, 2021. So beginning, which begins on October 1st of 2020. Okay. So what happens um, if you win the lottery? So you get selected, it's, you're notified. And by the way, um, if you are interested in, in in uh, signing up your, your online account, it is at myuscis.gov. So myuscis.gov is the, uh, the website for, for doing this, um, doing this, uh, this account. Um, somebody asked a question, if you apply, if you acquire a smaller company and that person has, um, and they have H-1B visas, uh, do you need to sponsor, you know, what do you need to do if you acquire a company with H-1B visas? Those H-1B visas, it depends. Um, so it depends on whether it's a, a stock purchase. So, um, so, so it depends on if it's a stock purchase or an asset purchase. And so, but generally, um, so it just, it depends on between the two because one, you need to file uh, to do the transfer over to the new company. And so you do the transfer over to the new company of the visa, of the H-1B visa, and then on the other, you would, um, 
the person you would just do the renewal and you would give an explanation like, hey, by the way, we have a new name and here's the new the new company. Um, and so you would transfer the you would get you at the renewal stage, you would notify the company, you would notify immigration that the person has a has a new employer. So it just depends on if it's a stock purchase um, or a uh, an asset purchase. But you should definitely like if you're doing acquisitions and you're identifying people who have visas with your uh, with the acquired company, you definitely um, should be reaching out to uh, to discuss that that situation um, and what and what process you should you should be going down. Um, so you win. So now now what happens? So you've got the H one B petition and you've got fees, right? So you're gonna you're gonna put the petition together. You're gonna pay somebody to do it unless you've got great expertise. This is not an easy process. Uh, to do so, unless you've got great expertise um, on doing H-1Bs, or you've you know you've done a bunch of them in the past, I do not recommend it. Um, it's not uh, necessarily intuitive, and there's a lot of process that goes into it. So you're gonna you're gonna pay somebody probably uh, to to do the petition for you. You're going to pay the fees, the 460, 1500, or 750, and then the 500, and then potentially premium processing. You're going to have the job description. So this is all going to go into your application, right, your petition. You're going to have the LCA that's been certified. You're going to have a degree equivalency if the person graduated from a U.S. university abroad. You're going to have a letter of support. You're going to wait, um, and then you're probably going to get an RFE. And then if you get approval, boom, um, you know, you're ready to start October 1st, and that's that's awesome. And then um, on a transfer visa, you could actually um, start working as as soon as the application is is filed. So um, I already talked about actually getting the actual visa, but just to rehash that, that the actual visa, that the approval for the H-1B visa is not the actual visa. The actual visa is going to come when the person leaves the United States for the first time. They're gonna then have to take some time and go to a U.S. uh, embassy and make the application with the Department of State at the U.S. embassy for the visa and get that put into the uh, the passport, at which point they can then re-enter and they'll re-enter on the H-1B visa. And voila, then the person has an H-1B visa, they can be in H-1B status for up to six years. The only way, uh, and then they're done, like no more H-1B renewals. So they can get it for a three-year period initially and then a three-year period extension, total uh, H-1B status in the United States of six years. So you need to know what's the next step. I really like this person. I want to keep them employed or maybe the person saying, hey, as a condition of employment, I'm going to leave you unless you sponsor me for continued work authority, which is the green card. So the green card is almost certainly going to be your next next step for, um, for sponsorship for the person. The green card process, depending on the nature of the person, there's some factors that go into this, but it could be, it could be literally like a 10-year process. Um, and so a lot of this stuff gets, I'm going to talk about it in a very condensed manner, manner, but it is potentially spread out over like a 10 year period of, of time. It could be spread out over a 10 year period of time. Um, and so, you know, this is not, um, it, this is not a fast process. H1B visas can be turned around in like two weeks. Uh, the H-1B application, that's like a two week. By the time you get the LCA and then file the H-1B, like that could be about two weeks. You'd pay another, you know, premium processing, get that done in another 15 days. So you're talking like start to finish, maybe 30 days, um, best case scenario for an H-1B visa. Green card, you're talking about like start to finish, potentially like 10 years um, before the person actually gets their green card. If they're from like India, for example, it could be like a 10-year wait for them. So we've got some, there's, you know, it's a disparity in in process, but I'm going to talk about it as if it as if it's just laid out in front of you really quickly. Um, so, what do we need to do? Like, why would you want to sponsor? So, um, you know, yeah, it's more expensive. It's about ten to thirteen thousand dollars with legal fees and filing fees and recruiting fees. I think that's about what you're looking for. Um, so. You know, if you're if you're looking at this and you're trying to price it out, you want to estimate about ten to thirteen thousand dollars on you know start to finish on fees for doing the green card. That's obviously a lot more expensive than the H-1B, which is going to be closer to like five thousand without premium processing, and um, you know right in that in that ballpark. But again, these this ten to thirteen thousand 
essentially spread out over a number of years. And so it's just going to come in fits and fits and spurts. Um, for the green card, unlike the H-1B, for the green card, we're going to actually have to do some recruiting. So when you hear about, like, oh, I need to recruit, I need to make sure, like, no U.S. citizens, that's not for the H-1B. Like, you can hire an H-1B B- H-1B person over a U.S. citizen if you want. Um, you know, I wouldn't be as uh, apparent about it, but the reality is you can hire H-1B. You don't have to tr- prove that you've tried to recruit a U.S. citizen. You just need to pay prevailing wages on H-1B people. Well, it's the same for the green card, except you also need to prove that you tried to recruit a more qualified U.S. citizen. And so the first thing we do, like with the H-1B, we've got to, we, we go and we obtain from the government, there's a bunch of um, wage uh, databases, but we file with the government, we obtain a prevailing wage certification. We take that prevailing wage certification, and then we advertise for the job. This is step two. This is the perm process. We advertise for the job. We recruit for the job. This is going to take several months. We have to, there are some statutory restrictions on us. It's going to take several months, but we are going to try to recruit. We are going to do postings, try to get as many people as we can in the job, in the door. We're going to put it in newspapers. We're going to put it in or trade journals. We're going to advertise it on like Indeed or Career Builder or something like that. But we're going to do a bunch of recruiting. It's got to be all following, you know, crossing T's and dotting I's for the government. We then file a bunch of paperwork with the Department of Labor saying we had a prevailing wage. We, we recruited, we didn't find any more qualified U.S. Uh, citizens for the job, and Department of Labor, could you please certify this job? Department of Labor hopefully certifies the job. That's the perm process. Boom, that's the end of step two. We then take that certification, and then start to finish, uh, it always, you know, there's always hits or miss, start, start to finish. Um, it's taking, by the way, three to eight months to get prevailing wages. So it could be anywhere from from like an eight-month period bef- from start to finish, or or it could be like a, a year-plus uh, period start start to finish, uh, even, even more if there's some hiccups along the way with prevailing wage. So anyway, this is not necessarily going to happen like overnight. Then we get the, the, the um, PERM certified, and we then apply for the green card. And the green card application is um, we complete the I-140 and we and we file the green card. That's the application for the green card, and that normally gets approved. Hopefully, you know, assuming it gets approved, it gets approved pretty quickly, and we can use premium processing for that. And then once that gets approved, then we check the visa bulletin. And if anybody is curious in tracking the visa bulletin, they issue it every month, and you just Google visa bulletin. The Department of State puts it out. And the visa bulletin tells us, because you can't have more than 7% of all the, H, of all the green cards come from more than one, from any one country. So, so you can imagine there's a lot more applications for green cards from people from China and from India. And so they're limited in the number of, of, uh, of, people, of green cards that they can issue to Chinese nationals and Indian nationals, for example, in all countries, but those are the two that, that uh, have the longest waits normally. And so you might have to wait. And so it might be like a five or six or seven or eight year wait until you can take that approved green card and then apply to adjust to the green card. So in the meantime, the person just stays as H-1B, and you can keep renewing the H-1Bs, uh, and that person can stay in H-1B status, and that's the one way to get beyond the six years for H-1B. And then once the visa bulletin says that you can make the application, then you make the application uh, for the um, to adjust the status to green card. And then when the person gets the green card, then boom, then they can like work indefinitely. They can work for anybody in the country, um, they can do that once they get the EAD. They might even get the EAD sooner than the, than the green card itself. Um, and so, yeah, so that's the process. It could be, you know, relatively fast, like take a year and a half or so for certain people that are highly skilled. Um, there's some nuances that every, you know, a lot of 
exceptions and everything as you can imagine this is not a super easy process but it could be it could be a fairly fast process it could be a very long drawn out process that takes many many years um so yeah so that's the that's uh the green card process going from h1b okay got a couple minutes let's talk about legolandian my four-year-old is really into legos right now and so it's kind of like lego crazy uh, at our at our house, he's really good at Legos and really loving it. So um, I wanted to use a an example of Lego uh, Legos. Okay, um, you just had the most exhilarating career fair ever. Congratulations! That rarely happens for HR people. I know on the recruiting side, uh, ever in that you found the best candidate of all time for your engineering company. Congratulations! Uh, you are concerned he can't work for you though because he's a Legolandian, and you heard you can't hire non-U.S. workers. What are your options if you want to hire him, right? So let's just review. You hire, he's going to be an engineer. Engineer, boom, that sounds like H-1B. You can't do L visa. He's not currently working for you abroad. H-1B is the way you want to, you want to go. Um, so you want to hire him. New visa, you're going to have to get into the lottery. So if you're having this career fair and it's the career fair is – Sometime after March 1st uh, or March 20th of 2020, you're not going to have a chance till the next March 1st to March 20th of 2021. Um, so you're going to have to hope that he's got an F visa from a U.S. university, that he went to a, he's graduating from a U.S. university, at which point he can work for you on an F visa, a student visa, for 12 months engineer, so he could get a 29-month extension on it. So if you're uh, enrolled in E-Verify, and the school has to has to give off the um, the STEM extension, but that is very possible. So the um, so you're going to have him for a while if he's you know on the F visa, uh, if if all goes well there. And in the meantime, you want to get into the lottery. So if you didn't make this year the 2020 lottery, you're going to want to do the 2021 lottery, and again go through the lottery process, online applications, ten dollar fee, uh, at least it's ten dollars in 2020. Online application, do that, do that whole thing. So, is there a path for him? Yes. Is it easy? Not necessarily. But if he's going to graduate, you want to hire him upon graduation as an engineer for your engineering company. Uh, then great. Then, if he's a current engineer and he came to this trade fair and he's a current engineer on an H-1B visa for another company, then you can apply right away for an H-1B visa to transfer his current H-1B visa because current H-1B visa. B, B visa people don't need to go through the lottery. They're already counted. So lottery is just for new people that don't have H-1Bs. So if he's currently an engineer working for some other company, you can transfer him to your company by filing an H-1B petition. Three years pass. You got him. He's on H-1B. He's great. He's a really awesome worker. Probably the best worker in your engineering company. The problem is that he's from Legoland and an H-1B visa, which is going to expire in three years. So uh, the, your, you know, your manager there wants to keep him forever. What are your options? Well, one, you're going to want to renew that H-1B. You've got to file the renewal before the H-1B expires. Um, two, you've got to get going on the green card process. If you want him to try to work forever for the company, the only real option, the H-1Bs are going to expire after six years aggregate. So you've got to get them on the, the green card. You've got to start that process because you've got to have an approved uh, I-140. So that's step uh, three in my – if we go back to the, the steps there, you've got to have an approved I-140 before this, um, this six years comes up. Uh, otherwise, you, you, and if that's the case, then you can continue to renew these H-1Bs indefinitely while you're waiting for the actual green card. Once he gets the green card, then he can start working for you on the green card forever. You never have to worry about visas and, and anything like that. And he can eventually become a U.S. citizen if he wants. So those are your options. It's, it's yeah, it's fairly straightforward, I, I guess, on the H-1B. Um, okay, perfect time. Uh, thanks for the uh, – there was one question, actually, before I move. Okay. Oh, he's marked it. Um, if the person is on an, a second uh, H-1B second renewal, can he work if he starts the green card process? And the answer is is yes, but you have to have the, the approved. So can you work, and just like I just said, um, can you work 
forever keep renewing H-1Bs if they're in the process? Yes, but um, you have to have the approved I-140, the approved green card. That's the that's the um, the the way. So um, thank you for the questions. And next month, we're going to be talking about fundamentals of wage and hour law, really exciting topic. And then we're going to be talking about advanced topics in, in April. So it's going to be a lot of wage and hour issues um, for the next, the next two months. And I hope you join us. It's a really cool uh, topic. And if you have any questions on the MyHR Genius program or this webinar series or this webinar itself, feel free to reach out to me directly at uh, kmocher at thompsonco.com. I hope everybody has a nice month.